Good evening and welcome to the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen, our Artisan Lecture Series. This is the final lecture of our spring program and to all of you a very warm welcome. Thank you for being here. My name is Victoria Dangle and I'm the Executive Director of the organization of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen. Uh, the program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council as well as the generous support of the Friends of the Artisan Lecture Series. We would also like to thank the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art and the New York Landmarks Conservancy for their promotional support for this event and welcome their members here this evening. For those of you not familiar with the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen, the Society was founded in 1785 by the skilled craftsmen of New York City. Artisans who represented 22 different trades, including carpenters, saddlers, tailors, and silversmiths, among others. Today, this 231-year-old organization continues to serve the people of the City of New York through its educational and cultural programs, including our Tuition-Free Mechanics Institute, the General Society Library, and our nearly two-century-old lecture series, of which the Artisan Series is a part. Uh, we also invite you to visit our lock museum upstairs, where you can see 350 locks all chronicled in a book called The Lore of the Lock, which is available for sale. The space you are in tonight is the library of the General Society. Founded in 1820, it is the second oldest library in New York City and one of the city's three remaining membership circulating libraries. As I always like to say, our archives date back to 1785, but we also have New York Times bestsellers. So it's, it's quite a range. Um, and so tonight we gather once more to pay tribute to the art of craftsmanship. Um, and we are so pleased to have uh, the opportunity to showcase our, this evening's lecturer. We have yet again in season six of this year's Artisan Lecture Series, we've had a magnificent selection of artisans who have come to speak about the intricacies of their work. Highlights of the series have included the installation and conservation of the Warsome Rockefeller Dressing Room at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. We had um, a lecture about freehand architectural drawings. We've heard from master tailors. We've heard from visual silhouette storyteller paper cutting. We've had architectural hardware, goldsmithery, jewelry, artisan conservation, pottery and lamp making, murals and crafted wall coverings, just to name a few. The Artisan Lecture Series founded by the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen has committed itself to giving voice to internationally known artisans who will come to talk about the intricacies of their specialized craft. The mission of the Artisan Lecture Series is to pr promote the work and art of skilled craftsmen to assist in ensuring that their unique knowledge is understood and carried forth for generations to come. To introduce tonight's speakers, I am pleased to introduce to you Karen Taylor, P Program Director of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen. Thank you. Uh, Good evening, a, a very warm welcome. As Victoria mentioned, this is the last lecture of the series and we really have a very special evening in store for you tonight. Um, this is inspired by the exhibit of the same name, tonight's program, Turquoise Mountain, Artists tr Transforming Afghanistan, and it's on view at the Smithsonian um, Arthur M. Sackler Gallery. And I happened to be there on Sunday, and I can say what a terrific and wonderful exhibit it is. And if any of you happen to be in D.C., in, is it, I'm not quite sure, I'm sure she was Shanna. Until, to, until, Jan, well, until January, so you have plenty of time to catch it. So hopefully you will be able to do that. Um, Tonight's, uh, tonight's program uh, will feature the, and forgive me if I mispronounce uh, Yust, uh, Nasser's name, Yustad Nasser Mansouri, um, who designed and created the architectural woodwork installation, Turquoise Mountain CEO, Shoshana Stewart, and architect Peter Panoy of 
of Peter Panoy Architects. Um, tonight they'll discuss the revival of Afghanistan's artistic traditions in Kabul and the United States. You will find bios for all of tonight's speakers on your chairs, but I'm going to read you all just a short introductory paragraph. And I should also say that we will also have Tommy, sorry Tommy, that I don't have your name, uh, Tommy Wilde, who will be joining NASA on stage to translate. So, very briefly, uh, first of all, um, Peter Panoy. Uh, Peter Panoy is a passionate and dedicated advocate for the relevance of traditional and classic architecture in contemporary practice. Peter established his firm in 1990 and it has since grown to include four partners, 50 associates and four interior designers. Peter has followed an unusual path in his career. Um, as an architect and historian. From his education at Columbia University in the early days of postmodernism to his first independent and modern commissions for the Warhol Factory and Keith Haring Pop Shop on Lafayette Street. Peter Panoy has emerged with a conviction that his firm could serve as a laboratory for the practice of architecture inspired by history. He has made the study of history the generating force of his firm and believes but that by mastering the interpretation of architectural history, he and his colleagues design projects that are both modern and classical. Shoshana Stewart is the CEO of Turquoise Mountain, an organization which she joined at its inception in 2006 and has been running it since 2009. Turquoise Mountain is a non-governmental organization which, re which works to rebuild historic cities and traditional crafts to create jobs, skills, and a renewed sense of pride. It was created in 2006 by Prince Charles and the Afghan president to do this in Afghanistan, but it has recently expanded to take on a project in Myanmar in partnership with Saudi Women in Crafts and an exhibition at the Freer Sackler, well, we just mentioned that, with galleries in Sonsonian in Washington, which is open throughout 2016. Nasser Mansouri, is one of the most accomplished classical carvers in the world. Nasser fled to Iran in 1989 at the age of 11 following the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. In Iran, Nasser was apprenticed to an Iraqi master of classical carving. It was here Nasser learned the precision, sense of design, and scrupulous attention to detail which was distinguish him from his peers. When NASA returned to Afghanistan in 2006, he was taken on as a woodwork master at the Turquoise Mountain Institute. Dr. Tommy Wilde first began working for Turquoise Mountain in Afghanistan in 2007, was the managing director in Kabul till 2015, and then became the director of exhibitions. He holds a DPhil in Afghan cultural theory from Balliol College, Oxford. He is fluent. In Dari and a Pashto speaker. As a curator for the exhibition at the Freer Sackler Galleries, Tommy oversaw design, content, content, and construction of the exhibition. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Shoshana the Stewart, the CEO of Turquoise Mountain. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, can you hear me without the microphone? Otherwise, it's one of these sort of things, which is a bit, Shush bit awkward. Shush just because we record it. Oh, yeah, sure. If you don't want it, sorry. Very good. Strike that from the record. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction. My name is Shoshana. Um, I run Turquoise Mountain. And it is a huge honor for us to be here. Uh, I really want to thank the General Society for having us. This is, as we've just heard, a 231-year-old institution that was created to support artisans. We are a 10-year-old institution that was created to support artisans. But sitting here, it is so wonderful and actually very humbling to understand that this is a sort of uh, universal value that we have across cultures, across countries, that artisans and the traditions and the jobs that they support uh, and that they carry on matters to us all over the place, uh, which is very exciting. I want to, to thank also um, our 
booksellers for coming today. Thank you so much. Um, and in particular to Peter, who has been the most wonderful introduction for us, who we met maybe two years ago, I'd say, um, about which more later. So let me introduce you to uh, a few of our artisans from Kabul. This is Nasser, and you will meet him, so I'm just gonna speak very briefly. This is a piece on the right, uh, a detail of a door that he made. Uh, it is over 500 pieces individually jointed of light and dark walnut wood. It's uh, inspired by a traditional Mamluk design. It's a pair of carved wooden doors. This is Saida. Uh, she created this 360 emerald uh, Turkmen design inspired piece, which is hanging along with pieces from Nasser and the stories of Saida and Nasser in the Freer Sackler at the moment. So please, please do go and see it. What I'd like to do is take a couple of minutes to bring you to Kabul uh, and give you a sense of how we got here to New York. So we were created 10 years ago, uh, as was said by the Prince of Wales, to do two things. Rebuild the old city of Kabul and revive the traditional craft industry. So we found ourselves here in the heart of the old city in a place called Murad Khani. And it's right on the banks of the river. The center of the city was the traditional silver bazaar. Uh, but when we found it, it was six feet deep in garbage. This is what three decades, now four decades and more of war does. Historic buildings collapsing, the poverty was immense. Uh, the craft masters were destitute. They weren't producing anymore. No water supply, no sanitation, no electricity, basically raw sewage in the streets. Um, so we just started cleaning. Uh, this is a sort of before, during, and after picture of cleaning out the garbage. Started repairing buildings. This is before, during, and after. We put in water supply, sanitation, electricity, stone paving down every street, uh, and offered a job to anyone in this part of the city who wanted it. And then in crafts. This is Abdul Hadi. He was 72 when we met him, and he was one of the great lattice woodworkers of Afghanistan. Uh, worked for the king. He was a famous man. People knew his name. But when we met him, he was just selling fruit in bazaar. He had been, for 15 years, had stopped producing. He didn't have any students, didn't have any markets. Uh, so what we did was round up all of these retired craft masters and started to build ourselves a school, at which point Nasser came back from Iran and became a teacher and brought this incredible skill set with him. We began to retrain in woodwork, uh, calligraphy and miniature painting, ceramics, and jewelry and gem cutting. Learned very quickly that the training was great, but it didn't really matter if people couldn't sell what they were making. So we brought in designers. Uh, this is a jewelry designer named Pippa Small. Um, she's been to Afghanistan many times and, and designed many lines for us. Those are sold, were sold in Kate Spade. And then in woodwork, which really I think is the most special thing that Afghanistan does, uh, we began doing some commissions, some interior design commissions, some small pieces. And then we met Peter, who was introduced by a sort of mutual friend of ours. And uh, I walked into Peter's office in New York, slightly looking up, going, oh my goodness, what is he going to think of us? And had my little book, was showing pictures of Afghanistan, was ready to tell him the story about all the people. And he just looked through the pictures very carefully and said, I like it. Will you send me some samples? So we sent some samples. And then shortly after, these beautiful renderings came through uh, over email uh, for this incredible project that he was doing, this house that he was building, uh, with, with detailed technical drawings of where the Afghan lattice work was to be. Uh, and, and there we went. So this is a, a picture of uh, our woodworkers in Kabul. Um, but doing something like this, a commission of this sort, is exactly what we, it means everything to this industry because this is the level that they need to be producing at and can. Um, so meanwhile, this is all happening. There are parts of the project that uh, were very unexpected, definitely not in the plan, but nobody was going to school, nobody was going to doctors, so we started small programs which grew and there's now a primary school with 200 half boys and half girls and a clinic with about 20,000 patients a year. And just to bring you from 2006 to 2016, uh, this is a before picture of the buildings, which Nasser spent a lot of time walking around and, and, and doing the, wood, the, the conservation woodwork for. This is before and after. And we did about 110 of these buildings. This is before 
and after. Um, and this building won a UNESCO award, uh, which is helpful because I get to run around Kabul with a big UNESCO stick, waving it at people who, <laughs> who threaten the heritage. Um, and in this building uh, is our institute of traditional Afghan arts and architecture, where we are training the next generation of woodworkers, ceramicists, uh, jewelers, gem cutters, calligraphers, painters. They graduate, like Saida, having been taught by masters like Ustad Nasser, uh, and they set up businesses, and we help them to set up businesses, and we help them to export, and together they have sold about $5 million worth of these products around the world, um, which is a beginning. So what I'd like to do, actually, is uh, give you a sense of what it looks like for Nasser to work with Peter, or rather, I'm going to hand it over to Peter and then to Nasser to talk through what that actually looks like. Uh, thank you, uh, Shoshana. As an architect, I'm thrilled to be able to explore the diverse paradigms that span the design world. Here we have Leonardo's Vitruvian Man, an essential icon of Western figural art. He is reaching out, rather cooperatively for me, to demonstrate that he is not merely a symbol of humanism, but fits perfectly into the basic building blocks of geometry, the circle, um, and the square. Vitruvian Man is juxtaposed to Kuf Karabiwa. Um, no one here should accept my pronunciation, by the way. Um, which translates as the four, four, four false hands, a diagrammatic way of explicating a typically complex Islamic geometric pattern. Uh, this diagram, based on squares, circles, polygons, and star patterns, which themselves are squares and polygons set within circles, reveal a devotion to the endless possibilities of geometry. What more can an architect wish for? Indeed, American architects, designers, and artists have long been inspired to weave the geometric patterns from the Islamic world into their work. The Masharabi type perforated woodwork, uh, which you see on this image on the left, which is a harem, is a perfect example of the kind of picture and the kind of place that inspired important uh, figures in American decorative arts and design, like Lewis Comfort Tiffany, who went on to order the pair of doors you see on the right of the screen from Lockwood de Forest's workshop uh, in uh, Ahmedabad in India, which supplied New York interiors uh, in the late 19th century. So um, de, de Forest was an important New Yorker in many fronts, including uh, founding the American wing of the Metropolitan, but here he was uh, producing uh, this, this kind of um, interior paneling and doors. What Tiffany, DeForest, and artists like Frederick Church found in geometric patterns was both order and imagination. Stanford White of the storied firm McKinmead and White excelled at the imaginative use of these elements from South Asia and almost everywhere else in the globe. In 1884, White designed this parlor stair hall, which you can see in the Metropolitan Museum. It's in the, um, in the basement somewhere. You pass through all sorts of architecture to find it, but there it is. Um, it was designed for the Metcalf family in Buffalo. Here, White deftly draws on artisan traditions and pattern making from Afghanistan, India, France, Japan, as well as colonial American architecture. Um, it would take a book to describe all the parts and how they're put together. He so soundly weaves these influences together that they cease to seem foreign at all, but make interior architecture for the distinctly American shingle style. In my own firm's work, at a very elementary level compared to the masters in the previous slides, we were always interested in expanding our vocabulary by incorporating new, unexpected elements. For a shingled house on Long Island, decorated by Matthew Smythe, we made a stair that opens into the living hall. This was a typical layout in the shingle style, 
where an open plan arrangement ruled on the ground floor, allowing stairs, drawing rooms, and halls to share one volume of space. At the landing here, we made a bench, almost a resting place, using a custom-made Mosharabi as a screen between the stair and the passage beyond. Lattice is particularly useful in creating transparent walls between spaces. And in my own house that was decorated by my wife, Katie Ritter, uh, here you're, we're looking at our lounge, which we called the Zamzam -Zam Room. Um, I cloud the fireplace wall in lattice panels set over mirror, reflecting the exotic furnishings and objects collected in our travels. Setting mirrors behind the panels adds a layer of mystery to the surface and was especially effective when our children used the room for disco parties. But this lattice, while beautiful, is basic or more basic in its patterns and definitely more basic in its craft compared to the geometries and lattice I'd seen in books on architecture in Afghanistan. So when I met Shoshana and saw the impeccable samples of Jolly Screens, I knew I was onto a source that would delight my colleagues and most important, delight our clients. As you can see, the perfection of the work, the fit of the joints, the consistency of the angles is astounding. Because these jolly screens are made of individual pieces of wood rather than solids or veneers, the grain and character of the tree becomes an essential ingredient in their appeal. Here in a painting by Genevieve Irwin from my office, you can see our design for a great room in a house we designed north of the city. This double height room in a building that appears to be a carriage house incorporates jolly screens from Turquoise Mountain flanking the benches and bookcases at the arched entrance at the center of the picture, almost like an ingle nook. And we also use jolly screens in other places. On the right, you see one, a very pale one, that is looking down into a stair beyond. Unfortunately, this project is still under construction, so I don't have finished pictures, but we'll be sending them to Shoshana by the end of the fall. We better, or else I might get fired. <laughs> um, by the way, the Jolly Screens arrived before our American contractor was ready to install them. They fit perfectly into millwork produced in New York, and Turquoise Mountain matched their wood color and finish exactly to a small sample we provided of the paneling that would go into this room. Not a mean feat when you're doing it from New York to New Jersey, but definitely impressive if it's New York to Kabul. Um, this is uh, a sample and a sample of uh, mosaic from Morocco and a sample of wallpaper uh, that has uh, vegetal Islamic decoration and a drawing and a little sketch for a mantelpiece. All of this is on a desk back at my office. We presented a room today to a client in the middle of the day, which they just approved. So we'll be putting in an order tomorrow for an entire wall of uh, a jolly screens um, that will... Um, <clears throat> so this room started as a more classical room um, and my wife is the decorator and she saw this wallpaper, this painted wallpaper, so th this joined the room and I decided that then we had to strip off all the paneling and make this into a Kabul-based project. <clears throat> so this is very exciting and um, it's another sign of more collaboration uh, to come, which is uh, a great thing for, for all of us. Thank you. Um, the only challenge here, I have to say, was that you provide us with too many choices, and we and our clients were sort of trying to narrow it down, and we're still at five. Um, before I turn the microphone over to Nasser Mansouri and Director of Exhibitions, Dr. Tommy Wide, I want you to understand an important point, which is that the craft and beauty and perfection of these jolly screens is so good um, that I, uh, d you know, that I would be ordering them, and my clients would be excited about them, even if they didn't know the backstory. Thank you. So um, we thought uh, Ustad Nasser um, could actually give a bit of that backstory um, now for us here. 
and استاد اگر ما میتونم شروع کنم شما میتونی که بزنید درباره چطور شروع کردی کارتان؟ اول سلام میگم خدمت So first of all, I'd like to say you know um, it's wonderful to be here. Um, hello, greetings. ما دسالش هست و یک وقت که در افغانستان جنگ شد و جنجالی که پیش اومد مجبور شدیم که So in 1983, this was actually um, when uh, the Soviets had invaded Afghanistan. I, he was from the Panjshir Valley, central Afghanistan. Uh, I was forced to leave Afghanistan at that time. Majrad uh, was that we were in the family of the Pakistan and in Pakistan the camp that was in the UN. So at that time, I fled to Pakistan, crossed, um, made, a, made a route east across the border with my family, and ended up in a camp run by the UNHCR. Because of some linguistic problems, really, they don't speak uh, Farsi, my language, in Pakistan. Um, we decided to go elsewhere and actually move to Iran, where they speak Farsi, very similar dialect to uh, my own. تقریبا این دو سال طول کشید که تا ما در ایران رسیدیم. So it's about two years in Iran. و در ایران تفاوت داشت امره پاکستان به خاطر کجا کم نبود باید داخل شهر زندگی میکردی و خودت کار میکردی و زندگی خودت پیش میبردی. For that point, Bruce. Yeah. Yeah. So Iran differed really from Pakistan in that I, you know, we were able to work there most of all. In Pakistan, in the camps, it was very difficult, but in Iran, much easier. و در اون وقت شاید یک سه سال چهار سال من تونستم مثلا در مکتب برم درس بخونم به خاطر که قانون یک رقمی بود که افغانا و کسایی که مهاجر بودن نمیتونستن برن داخل مکتب و برای تحصیل برای درس خوندن برای زیکا پا سه چهار سال بود سه چهار پنج 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 سال بود For example, yeah. yeah. So I was able to for a couple of years. و یک یک کورسای بود که برای کسایی که درس مونده بودن سنشون زیاد بود برای ایرانیا بود ولی او یک چانس بود برای ما که ما بتونم فکر کنم که آدم 50 ساله بود ما هم دقیقا از وقتی یک باشه 5 ساله 6 ساله. It was really a class actually that was designed for older children. These were kind of 15-year-old Iranians, and I was a I was a شش سال بودی. I was like a I was like a five or six-year-old, but I was allowed to sit in with them. But as بعد از یک سه چهار سال که دو درس خوندم باز و بگه او یک کورسای کوتاه مدت بود که من میرفتم بوز میکردم و میگاشم کوچه میرفتم میبرم میرفتم سو آی استادی فور 3 اور 4 ایرز بت افتر دت استاپت اند اند ریلی آی واز جاست اون اون دی استریتس کیکینگ مای وای اراوند ہی سید ہی یوز ٹو پلے ا لوٹ اف فٹبال اند جاست جاست ہینگنگ اوٹ اون دی استریٹس و یک روز خواهر من برام گفت که این رقمی خونه میجه تو باید یک برای زندگی برای آینده بعد یک کار بکنی یک کار بعد بکنم که تو بعد یاد زندگی تو بعد آینده بتونی بچرخونی so my my sister actually said at this stage that you've you've got to do something think about your future about your life um you you you've got to do something at this stage نزدیک خونه از یا یک تا یک شاب بود که کننکاری کننکاری میگه یک تا یک استاد بود از عراق and actually near my house was a workshop where um, there was an Iraqi woodworker so all um, muhajir would name so he was himself a, a refugee from Iraq at that time um, who was living in Iran doing woodwork but تقریبا 12 سال بود که ما پیش از اولام شروع کردم یاد گرفتن که اصلا من هیچ نمیفهمیدم از چوب و از نجوری و از دو سال 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 فقط یک خوارم برای ما پیشنهاد کرده و کی برای آینده خوب از بعدی کار یاد بگیری هر رقمی که میشه مای سیستر جس سید یو نو یو گوت گو یور فیوچر گو این ورک و ای استاد من خیلی مرا تشویق میکرد همیشه برای ما یاد میداد همیشه و مشکلی بود که دوجه دو وقتی امی کار کننکوری در ایران کار که امرا دست میکنم وقت زیاد ضرورت داره یعنی 800 900 نیست من باید So when I started, my teacher was really helpful. He encouraged me, taught me a lot. But you know, this type of carving is extremely labor-intensive. It's not something you do in seven or eight hours. I would be up with the the first light of dawn and working until night. و یک ما یک بچه دو هزار سال دوست داشتم که فوتبال بازی کنم دوست داشتم که مثلا بگردم دوست داشتم که ایبرو برم ولی مجبور بودم که 
البته این فقط برای یاد گرفتن نبود به خاطر از یامو که بعد یک مدرم پول پیدا کنم بتونم که خانواده رام کمک کنم so you know it was tough for me I was a 12 year old I just wanted to play football to be honest and here I was being forced to work and it wasn't just to learn but also I knew I had to make money I was supporting my family نزدیک به پنج سال ما امره استاد عراقی کار کردم و برای ما یاد داد it was five years I worked with him he taught me but by as pain so so the member of the to buy it but hurt business going to be hurt to be done he said at that time you should go and set up your own business actually and um, you you're kind of ready to do so but what did you mean sir John but I'm really calm because I wouldn't cause or wouldn't give him a car with them back as he can شاید بتونه کار بکنه شاید سر وقت بتونه خلاص کنه شاید نتونه به خاطر این خیلی کم بود کسایی که اعتماد بکنن برای من کار بدن you know i was so young that actually very few people trusted me you know as a young guy that i was going to do it on time to the requisite quality ولی من همیشه کسایی که خودم میرفتم پیشون از پیشون میگفتم خب برای من کار بدید ولی سر قیمتش گپ نمیزدم که چه خمی گیرم به خاطر که So if a customer come, I, we'd never talk about price because basically the idea was that, you know, I would I would make it and then afterwards we could talk about price. If he liked it, you know, he might pay me. If not, not. But, خلاصه ای تا 2004 پیش از که اتفاق داد افغانستان رفت و دویا که ما که مثلا امتر شدو تصمیم گرفتیم که برگردیم افغانستان. So in 2004 I decided to return to Afghanistan after the, the changes that had seen since the fall of the Taliban in 2001. وقتی که افغانستان رفتیم ما در افغانستان هیچ چیزی نبود. یعنی وقتی در کابل ما رفتیم واقعا در کابل نه برق بود نه دکان بود نه چوب بود. When I arrived there was really nothing in Afghanistan. There were no shops, there was no electricity, there was there was no wood. بسیار خب به خاطر که این تنها چیزی بود که من ایرا یاد گرفته بودم و این میتونه زندگی ما بشه خانه من مجبور بودم که یک کار بکنم که امی امو فعال ام چیزی که برای دستم امو کار بکنم you know I, I, I had to do the only thing I knew what to do which is woodworking the only thing I could do خیلی گشتم در کابل یک نزدیک یک منطقه از پلارتن فقط یک دانه عرب بود که And I was walking around all of Kabul, and you know what? There was only one bandsaw in the whole of Kabul by a bridge, Puliartel. It was the only one in the whole city. And wood was the same everywhere I looked. I couldn't find any wood. یا قریه نزدیک کابل به نام سالف و ما فکر کوچه چوب است در حقیقت که در زمان طالبا خوش شده و از بین رفته او رو میفروشن so there's a village nearby kabul in the north called the stalif and uh, you know i'd heard there was wood there that they've been drying wood there بوز ما رفتیم اونجا درخت خریدم چوب so i went there and i actually just bought a tree و چالش کی بود که او بریدن از هم یعنی بعد از ما قطور میزدی و کارو من you know i had to cut it and there was no one to help me with cutting it down Finally, I got it cut and, and actually brought the whole tree down to Kabul. Cut. مشکل زیاد بخواد که برق هم نبودی شاید سه هفته طول کشید که در اخت بریده شد قطع شد و تو تو شد که در کابل رسید سه هفته بریدن هم شد It took three weeks because the electricity was always cutting in and out It was really, really difficult خب بسیار ولی به صورت پیش می رفت و خاطر که افغان ها می اومدن و That time things started to improve You know, this was a period um, Lots of Afghans were coming back from, the, from abroad um, with, after the fall of the Taliban و ما از افغانستان یه چیزی هم نمی فهمیدم به خاطر که از اگجای آمده بودم که از گذشته افغانستان که جنگ چرا شده چرا خراب شده چرا برق نیست چرا You know, I actually really knew very little about Afghanistan, um, you know, and I couldn't understand why is there no electricity, why is the fighting going on? It was all very confusing for me. Uh, So until 2006, I heard about this organization had been set up that was teaching Afghans, helping Afghans, um, you know, doing woodwork, this kind of thing. And I, I got introduced to them. As soon as I was employed, you know, things were very readily available for me and very quick to learn. I was very happy to learn from him. 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 I was very happy to learn from
فقط کمک کردن یاد دادن و دوباره زنده کردن یه مو چیزایی بود که اوج از بین رفته بود. من میخواستم یاد بگم تیش نیاد گرفتم بودم. اما وقتی که ماشینی دیم از فیروزکو ببایشی شما خواستی چی؟ یاد بگیرم بخاطر yeah. so, you know, I was just really hungry to learn so this was an exciting opportunity for me uh, but uh, فیروزکو باید شد که ما در مراد خونه در شهر کنه چون در قد دمو و همه یادم میگه قرار بود که یک چیز جور کنیم که سنتی باشه و روری ما گفت که ما میخوایم که یک پنجره جور کنیم که بعد چیز داشته باشه سنتی باشه and so i really wanted to make something traditional and uh, rory stewart the man who set up turquoise mountain said to me look we need some windows panjara bud ne i need some windows that are traditional pas shuru kardi gach vaqte ke ma raftim guft do se to tar bud u سنتی نبود ما رو روان که گفت که نبرید در شهر کنه در مرادخونی و در یک قسمت دیگه ببینید که چیزای سنتی در گوزه so there were two or three windows there already they weren't good and, and Rory said to me look go to the old city go and learn get, go, go around عکس گرفتیم اون چیز من برای اولین بار در خونه رفتم and the first time I went and saw one of these houses خونه در دلات چپ بجده هم بود it was totally destroyed falling down و دیدم که در داخل ازش کننکوری از چوکی در کلکونی گپاز و and inside beautiful carving windows etc یعنی برای اولین بار من در او وقت آشنا شدم فهمیدم که او یک وقت ایجه بوده and it was the first time that I realized that wow there was really something here before و عکس گرفتیم باز دو دیزاین کردیم اسکیچ کردیم پس هم دادیم باز دو ای جور کردیم من یک چیزی که I did designs I, and, I, and I made this for, for Rory و امو شد که من زیاد علاقه من شدم به اینکه خب خانه قدیمی زیاد می فهم تو برداشت کردم که قبل زمان قدیم اینجا خیلی نجار بوده خیلی کننکار بوده. I realize you know there've been a lot of woodworkers actually in the past working in this area. ولی اول جنگ بوده یک تعداد شاید برآمده باشن که تعدادش مرده یعنی یک تعدادش از بین رفته ولی کسی نمونده. It was fighting people had fled the country people had died etc. و او شد که ما یاد یاد گرفتم همیشه هر وقت می رفتم پیاده در او کوچه های شهر کنم می گشتم so I was used to learn I just walk through the alleys and find my way around the old city و در اوجه ای که در اوجه فیروز که کار می کنم و خاطر ساختن از او در اوجه همه می رفتم می شد سایی می کنم و کار هم می کنم بعض وقت ها and the, you know I, I got working there and started to restore these buildings and و او چیزی که خودم یاد می گرفتم در داخل این استود یاد می دادم با بچه ها و کسایی که نو می آمدن و کسایی که در اوجا جوان بودن And those things that I learned, I, I then started to teach So there was a new generation of students that I was then trying to train in the same things that I had actually just been learning ای تا دو از دارو تقریبا سیزده فکر میکنم که ما در فیروزکو وظیفه می بود که امیاد بگیرم و امیاد بودم با کسایی که در بولیمیان So until 2013 that was my process really I was learning and I was teaching at the same time و بعضی چیزای بعضی پروداکت ها رو هم جور بکنیم به خاطر که بتونیم به اون نفر نشون بدیم که and now I'm making products that I could show people and sell. و استاد اگه شما میتونید که بزنید در باره امو روابط بین سنتی چیز سنتی کش چون ما جور میکنیم و از 2013 به بعد ما مستقل فیروزکو کمک بکه که ما بتونم خودم برای خودم یک بزنس داشته باشم. So in 2013 I decided to go independent and set up my own business. ما در وقتی که فیروزکو در فیروزکو کار میکردم و درس میدادم چیزای چیزی که یاد گرفتم چیزی که برای ما فهمیدم که مهم است این است که چیزای سنتی را اول یاد بگیریم درست بفهمیم مطالعه کنیم و او را تبدیل کنیم به یک چیز مدرن که مثلا قابل استفاده باشه و او کارهایی که قبلا داشت او کارهایی نباشه یک کارهای دیگه هم داشته باشه so in the thing i really learned at turquoise mountain was to focus on the history of these traditional techniques these traditional designs but introduce a modern element perhaps in terms of usage something that could be used by customers today و همیشه چیزایی را جور میکردیم مثل مثلا جولی فقط برای کلکین بود برای جایی بود که کمک نور بیا ما را تبدیل میکردیم برای میز برای برای میز نانخوری برای پتنوز برای چیزایی که پروداکت هایی که قابل استفاده باشه so take jolly for example so jolly this type of lattice design was used traditionally for windows um, we used to let a certain amount of light in uh, often in uh, high up windows in the houses and so i'll turn this into say a tray or a coffee table or even an art piece mm. و چیز دیگه که مهم بودی بود که خلاص نشه در اون چیزایی که قبلا بوده مثلا 5 تا یا 10 تا دیزاینی که قبلا کار می‌کردم ما بتونیم مزو یاد بگیریم و یک کم کم انکشاف بدیم که بیشتر شه و تعداد اما دیزاین‌ها یک کم که بتونیم اون رو کلانترش کنیم زیاد and it's not just these traditional designs say 5 or 10 main jolly designs they use i want to expand the repertoire of designs that use so i've been making new designs that they use 
For example, uh, e e yaki yes. So this is actually one of Ustad Nasser's designs, this one up here. This isn't from traditional buildings. This is him d using a new form of, uh, of design. Well, بیشتر در چیزای سنتی که قبلا بوده از میخ و از چیزا استفاده نمیکردیم ولی ما امو کارا میکنیم استفاده نمیکنیم از میخ چیزا از موتکنیکاز ولی یکم که تغییر میاره ما مدرن ترش میکنیم که قابل استفاده But um, you know that traditional design of never using nails um, you know I continue with that so all these pieces don't use any nails at all I'm just updating the form so that we can sell it in different ways بعد از 2013 وقتی که ما برای خودم برای اوج بزنس مستقل داشتم اونا یک سری چیزا تولید میکردم که امره پیتر یک and after i set up my independent business this is when i started working with with peter recently working on this project یک سری چیزای یک سری پروژه خود کجا که دیگه هم که بود another small small projects that I, i've been doing independently which stood with them or robert get peter شما گفت یک مشکل بود خاطره که من دارم امره پروژه که امره پیتر کار کرده so my memory of the project that i was doing with peter ما چیزی که ما یاد گرفته ایم متریک بود سیستم متریک so the thing i really learned it, well the way i learned originally was actually the metric system و اسکیچی که برام راه کرده او اینچی بود yeah and peter's sketches that were sent were in inches و همیشه درست نمیفهمیدم که خیلی کمک میکردم برای ما که بفهمم که یک این چند سانتی میشه چند میلی میشه. It was actually a real help for me to learn, you know, how much, how many centimeters in an inch. That was an important lesson. و بعد ما فکر میکنم که تاوله هم شاید یک درم مشکل داشته باشم سر درست بفهمم که زیر اینچ چند سانتی میشه چند میلی میشه. Yeah, so it's, it's, it can be a big problem if you get that wrong. And I might interject that we did get that seriously wrong when we were working for the Indian Embassy last year, where we were asked to make samples of large tables, and uh, we got the inch uh, to uh, the imperial to metric mistake. And NASA, with my help, managed to make some very very small uh, dining tables, uh, and uh, rather embarrassed ourselves in front of the ambassador of India. <laughs> Okay, Tashakur, I don't know if there's Thank time you. for questions, but Thank Ustad would be very happy to answer them. Tashakur, Ustad. Okay. He says thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. A question here. Uh, back here. Sorry. All right. Uh, just by way of background, I'm a textile and rug collector. I collect uh, Baluch and Turkmen Ersari uh, uh, fabrics uh, and textiles. Uh, and a funny story, uh, one of my favorite <laughs> rug dealers is Ali Istalifi from the town from we, where we you got a tree. <laughs> so I know where Istalifi is, okay. Uh, three quick questions. The first question is, uh, you know, does, does, uh, does Nasser think his uh, product is basically Afghan, Iraqi, Iran influenced, or just his own. I, I, I know this isn't an Iraqi or Iranian design. You know, and these is, all these Islamic designs have certain similarities with each other. ما گفتم قبل از اینکه افغانستان برم اصلا یه چیزی در مورد دیزاین اسلامی نمیفهمیدم به خاطر که سیستم کار ایران یک رقم است که بیشتر دیزاین غربی را کار میکنن Yeah so actually when I was in Iran I really didn't know much about uh, Islamic design most of the things I was making were very much western influenced this was mobile furniture but yeah. he was making furniture mostly in Iran um, kind of western style furniture فقط ما وقتی که در 2006 در فیروزکو اومدم از هم فنی که بلد بودم تکنیکی که بلد بودم استفاده کردم ولی دیزاینر کلا ارتباط داره با ما so I was using the techniques I'd learned in Iran, but the design was very much the, the things that I was finding in Afghanistan. Yes. So this design, for example, previously wasn't um, uh, created in wood, but you would see it in other mediums. You know, in kind of illumination yeah, work or, yeah, geometric design. That's my, my quick follow-up question, sorry, uh, is, uh, and that was my real question. You know, is, is this, uh, that's to you as a historian perhaps, uh, where, where did these designs come from? And it's a two-part question. One is, uh, you know, I hear it's Quran covers that from which uh, you had architectural elements, from which you had woodwork. 
uh, and then it came to textiles, and otherwise you hear it's from felts uh, and so on. Uh, the second dispute is, uh, uh, you know, Islamic geometry is what Peter emphasized. Uh, are they interpretations of floral elements, like carnations, tulips, etc., or, uh, uh, you know, highly controversial, are they anthrop anthropomorphic elements uh, involved? <laughs> I mean, he sees it as coming from a geometric source. Um, I'm going to say, for example, what do you mean? When I was in the design of the design, I was in the design of the design. So with these traditional designs that I'm using and learn. But the thing is, if you don't have a design, you don't have a design. So he sees these designs, you know, very much connected not with a single village but with the whole imperial exchange going on. So this, is, this one is particularly um, connected to the Timurid Empire, for example. And I've, I've seen this similar motif in, in books. In, in miniature paintings from that period. And in stonework. Koshi. And tile work as well. As he designed the Koshi, the Herat Korjada? You'll see it made in, uh, in tile work in Herat in western Afghanistan. The Mazar Korjada? And also in Mazari Sharif in the north. The Kabul, like, There's also a, a, a mosque called the Kartisakhi Mosque where you'll, you'll see this work too. I'm afraid I don't feel like I've answered your question, but maybe <laughs> we can talk afterwards. Hello. Yeah, I'd like to understand if there's how we would describe the difference between North Africa and I guess shorthand is Moroccan Great. design and yeah. uh, Islamic design. So Moroccan and Islamic design, what sort of difference you'd so, identify? So I know Stod Nasser could talk from the, the kind of technical aspects on that. Peter, I don't know if you'd yeah. be influenced in the <laughs> interest in the Okay. خب پس مثلا امو فرق بین مشابیه که شما می‌بینید که شمال آفریقا و جالی که هست در افغانستان. این شما گفتی برای من. ما بیشتر می‌تونم با از امو تکنیکی برات بگویم و و نظر از چیز شکلی. So I can talk from a perspective of, of technique and, and, and design form. مشابیه بیشتر so the mashrabiya work that you see in North Africa has these straight lines. So the design is in the holes that are created where the wood isn't, as it were. And the difference with the jali, the Afghan jali, is that there's really two patterns going on. There's both the patterning of the, the, the hole, the, the shape created by where the wood isn't, and the wood itself. And the, the process of making is different between Mashabir in North Africa and Afghan. So Mashabir has got one joint. Yeah, and in, in Mashrabiya they use a rounded, uh, turned, uh, jar, uh, turned wood, so it's circular. And, and the wood that they use in Afghanistan, rather than rounded, is straight lines, basically. And it's quite noticeable, actually, if you're in the um, museum of the Metropolitan Museum, they've got some nice Moroccan mashabir where you'll see this circular versus this type of Charlie. It's easier to see it, perhaps, than I'm explaining it. That's that's all I know. <laughs> Nasa says. Hi. Thanks. Um, I, if in Iran, you you were learning. Uh, basically Western style woodwork. Uh, how, when you went to Afghanistan, how did you learn 
these traditional techniques. So I learned carving in Iran. So we weren't just studying there and learning these skills. We were actually doing it on the job. So I'd be going into houses and doing copies of the old buildings. So actually just basically just trying to copy exactly what was there. Very fortunately, there were a couple of people left who still knew how to do this, like Shoshana was saying with the old man. Ustad Abdul Hadi. Ustad Abdul Hadi. So Ustad Abdul Hadi, the old Kingswood worker, was Nasser's teacher. Dajali, and particularly in Jali, this work. You know, having trained as a carver, he really wasn't a Jali maker, but Ustad Abdul Hadi taught him. And the people I was working with were at least twice my age, and actually some of them had some experience in this. So. So they knew. Well, Shema has on her. So I was learning both from my compatriots, these older people who I work with, but also from the buildings themselves, from working on the job. I want. I want to know uh, how well accepted his work is in. Afghanistan, you know, whether they will accept it, does he sell there, and is it like safe? And the second question is for Shoshana. I'd like to know a little bit more about why the prince decided to create this, you know. So I think because of the 30, 40 years of fighting, most people are really like myself, as in they'd forgotten what Afghanistan had. So we, we started Turquoise Mountain and we started making pieces that would, were in very visible locations. For example, he did a library at the university in Kabul. People were going back and forth the whole time, so we're seeing you know, these old Afghan designs. Also, the American University in Kabul did a project. And then for the Afghan embassy in Tokyo, say. <laughs> So those, those Afghans that had some money, I think, learned from seeing these projects, um, you know, what we had and, and what, what they could buy, I suppose. So really, last year, for example, about 50% of the things I make were sold inside Afghanistan. But actually, at a slightly different quality level, like, uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's a bit cheaper, the things that, you know, and <laughs> the things he sells inside Afghanistan. Um, yes, Shoshana. Um, so, this project uh, is actually a total embodiment of what the prince loves. Uh, he, if you look at some of the other charities that he has, he has 16 projects that he started himself and really is still the, the, the head of. Uh, loves tradition 
and traditional arts. He loves the built environment, sustainable urbanism, cities where people interact with each other and live near where they work. Um, and so the actual way that we're created is that he, the, President Karzai, who was the president for about 10 years, right after the fall of the Taliban, uh, was in London with the prince. They struck up a friendship and they were at the Prince's School of Traditional Arts in London. And the president sort of said, oh, it's so wonderful that you're doing this. They do, they do quite a lot of it in Islamic art. Wouldn't it be lovely if we had something like this in Afghanistan because we're losing all of our traditions? And the prince, who basically is sort of a serial entrepreneur, uh, <laughs> sort of sent Rory out to Kabul and went, do something, start it. And there we are. <laughs> Question about security as well, was that right? Yes. Oh, to him, about no, safety. Was it for him? Well, does he feel safe? Yeah, I think he's very concerned. 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 Of course, there's problems. But, you know, we just got to keep going. We've got to live. Mm. Um, this is a terrific work. Uh, speaking as an amateur woodworker, so, I can oh, certainly yeah, appreciate the uh, skill level. Um, but I was curious, what's the finish? on the wood? Is it simply sanded or is there any product applied? So the polish that I did for Peter's project? So I actually, went, I actually went in 2013 to London for a month's Polish course um, with one of the, the great um, Polish experts in London. Mm. It's like a Spanish Polish I was using. Mm. Yeah, it's like a beeswax I was using. And also, Chobichalmas, yeah, Pusti Chalmas. Pusti Rangi Walnut watercolor? Walnut watercolor, yes. Is that like in it? Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, Pusti Chalmas, no. So some, sometimes they use the actual skin of walnuts to, to get the color, but this is like a walnut colored finish. Okay, so to, just to protect the wood a bit more, I use something that's like sealer, sealer, sealant. As used for the and I use that too. Uh, Nasser, can you tell us about your students and your apprentices? Um, your, you teach at the Afghan Institute of Arts and Architecture, and you also have a business. And can you talk to us about the apprenticeship system in Afghanistan? To talk historically in the olden days. This kind of handiwork was a family business. Yeah, it went from father to son. But Turkish man is a bit different. You know, we have a system where students come from anywhere. But a six old doja. And they study for three years. Mm. But the, the work that I do inside my own workshop, so I, I'm looking to hire someone who's got some um, acquaintance with, with this profession of woodworking. 
بیشترشون کسایی هستن که از فیروزکو فارغ شده ان most of them who have actually graduated from turquoise mountain so they've studied for three years and are then going out و کسایی هم که دیگه علاقه دارن در بیرون کار کردن یعنی در و میان there's also a, a number of people who work outside in various places ام ورق میگم یاد گرفتم ام کار میکنم به خاطر کار میکردم به خاطر که پول بدست بیارم you know that the system is such that they're working and making money و هم دیگه او چیز یک مدار خودم رو کامل تر کنم بیشتر یاد بگیرم and they're also you know becoming more complete woodworkers mm. learning as they go to ایره یک رقمه در داخل سیستم در داخل کار خانم باشه که کسی که هرچی که بیشتر یاد بگیره میتونه بیشتر پول پیدا کنه and it's a system whereby you know the more, the more they work yeah. the more they're going to get paid well, بیشتر یاد میگیرن بیشتر, بیشتر یاد میگیرن sorry the more they learn the more they get paid so yeah. kind of level <laughs> Perhaps you can talk to us about the Afghan Institute. Sure, sure. So Stad Nasser taught, used to teach there, it doesn't anymore, but that's an institute where we have 150 students at any time in four departments. So calligraphy, ceramics, woodwork, jewelry. They get an international accreditation, so the city and guilds. Um, we are the center for city and guilds of Central Asia, so they graduate. And I suppose we've been looking for that sweet spot between the apprenticeship system, a traditional apprenticeship system, and a more formal, uh, formalized system that we would be more familiar with in the West. I think both have value and both have some weaknesses. So uh, by having the three-year training course, they get that kind of accredited, formalized training. But then we support them go and work in businesses, for example, NASA's, where they have more of an apprenticeship-style training. So we're trying to give them both at the same time because actually we don't know what's going to happen in Afghanistan, but also we don't know um, what's the best, we're not always sure what the best way to get a job is. Some people look for the stamp, the piece of paper, and some people want to know that they've done 10 years of practice. So we're trying to do everything to give them the best chance they can of, of finding work in the marketplace. Uh, what I was very interested in was to hear his years of learning his process uh, and discovering. I say to you, I'm thinking, how parallel this is to our Pratt Institute School of Architecture process. Our freshmen start working with wood and its joinages. And then at some point when they join my work in Islamic architecture, geometry, the underlying geometry has been around since the ancient Tigris Euphrates. It traveled throughout the world, not only through Islam and pre-Greek and Roman cultures, but the Silk Road through Afghanistan and elsewhere was a major, major transference of all these patterns. And today, the most modern of architects, if you really look at the space structures, space frame structures, etc., there are all these basic, similar kinds of underlying geometry I mean, and, and our big task which I wonder if it happens with his students in a way when students sit down with a computer they start just doing shapes but they have to have a sense worldwide of underlying geometry and I wonder if they do that in his school a basic underlying geometry that will guide these wonderful shapes the institute is a design So we actually teach in the institute a course in geometry. And as you know, as you well know, as you're saying, you know, geometry is at the root, is at the base of all this Islamic art. برای شاگردان رقم یاد می داده میشه که اول اساسات هندسه یاد داده میشه و قوانین میشه so they're taught in a way that they, they understand the underlying principles um, و کل از او امره کامپیتر نیست امره دسته است and it's not, it's not with computer this is by hand و بعد برای از او وقتی که قانون یاد می گیرن و از هندسه معلومات بدن با او آزاد هستن که در داخل هم چوکات قانونی از خود خلاقت بکنن اضافه کنن and, and so بکنن. once they've learned these basic laws uh, then they're allowed to play with it a bit. It, it, we don't just want, it's not just a kind of copying process, it's actually creative at the same time. Um, oh, please. Um, I just make two points because this is so important. Um, one is that the, 
the prince um, completely agrees with you and teaches uh, geometric design in his drawing school and in the School of Traditional Art. It's a fundamental part of those courses. And he's always been very firm on that uh, with us. And, and obviously, everything that you say is true. If you walk through the halls of the Institute, what you'll see is huge, um, basically, pieces of playing around, as Ustad Nasser has said. The students are perpetually making geometric patterns with different colors and, and different structures uh, all over the place. You're surrounded by huge posters of them. There are some cards in the back, which are just a few of, of the pieces that they've made, but basically, it is in everything that we do. Um, and we only do it half as much as we should do. It, it has to, it's been lost so much, those fundamental principles, so we feel like we have to really drive it home. And I might mention that it's taught across all the different subjects. So everyone does geometry, whether you're a calligrapher or a jeweler or a ceramicist. Everyone learns and it finds its expression in every different medium. Uh, who's next with the microphone? Be our last question. Last question. Thank you. Can you say a few words about the process of assembling the jali? And for example, can you source all your wood in materials in Afghanistan? And if you're not using nails, is it just joinery or is it glue? So everything you see here, it's all, it all comes from inside Afghanistan. So this is uh, wood from northern Afghanistan, walnut, Afghan walnut. Well, the things that we now do, we can do. The things that, like, like patnus or like base maize or chowki we gapo. The things that now, the things that were old, like ah, that were made from old, and chess pan, like that, we don't make it. We don't make it. We don't make it. Ah. But the things that we now do, we can do. We can do chess pan, like yeah, so he's um, with pieces like a tray, he's using glue. But only in the four corners here, just to make it strong. So all the pieces internally are done by, um, with two pieces of wood, you cut out half and cut out the other half and then slot them together. And, and then these ones on the side, they have a little wooden pin that slots in the side pieces. Yeah, you can, you, yeah, the pins are going in yeah. here, in here, in, well, I mean, yes, no, no. And, the, and these ones here. If you look closely, you can see a, a little line here. And you can see where um, the, there's been a, a slot cut in this yeah. piece, and that piece has gone in like that. Yeah. And if you look very carefully along here, you'll, you'll see the seams and how they work together. And I might mention just for the exhibition, if I just go back, it's um, several tons of Himalayan cedar that we shipped to DC. It was like Afghan IKEA. The whole thing just, <laughs> the whole thing flat packs. And uh, if I just show you, there isn't a single nail in this whole structure. So we've got colonnaded arcades down both sides. This is called a Sayaban. The whole thing is started nicely designed. It's like ten in the mortise joints. It just slots together the whole thing. Thank you so much. I would like to thank Peter, first of all, for um, suggesting this lecture to the first instance, in the first instance, um, and of course for his su active support of Turquoise Mountain. Um, Shoshana and Tommy, it's been really wonderful to get to enough, have an opportunity to know more about your fabulous organization. Nasser, it has been really wonderful and we are honored that you are here and you are one of the artisans who has spoken. So thank you so much for your uh, uh, absolutely exquisite, elegant work. So on behalf of us all, thank you very much.
On occasions like these, for those of you who've been here before, it is our tradition to make a presentation to the artisans. So could I ask the four of you to come up to the front? Yes. Right. And I, and I join Karen um, Taylor in, in thanking you so much for this, uh, for the, the detailing of your work, we, um, the amazing story of Turquoise Mountain, and, and also to, to Peter for bringing it to the United States, and Peter, a true champion of, a true friend and champion to artisans across the world. And so, Peter, we thank you for that. So, on behalf of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York, founded 1785, we express our gratitude to Turquoise Mountain, Artists Transforming Afghanistan, with artisan Ustad Nasser Mansouri, Turquoise Mountain, uh, CEO Shoshana Stewart, and Peter Panoya of P Peter Panoya Architects for their participation in the General Society artisan lecture series. So we have two plaques, so we'll give those, and to Tommy as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And then, congratulations. Thank you. And thank you. And one to Peter. Peter, thank you, thank you. so much. Thank, thank you so thank much. You. And to Tommy, thank you. So thank And those of you who are regulars, you know at this point we present the Lifetime General Society membership, but these are truly out of town, <laughs> from out of town. So we, we, we will say to you instead, we still very, very importantly, when you come to New York, you always have a quiet place to sit. So we welcome you to our home, which we... Um, founded by 22 artisans in 1785. So we welcome you, a warm welcome to the home of the artisan. So thank you. Thank you.